Even with human abuses, nature is resilient. Despite tons of phosphates, nitrates, and a host of solid waste pollutants poured into it, Lake Erie is an amazing body of water with a vibrant ecosystem that offers billions of dollars of economic utility. Fishermen today enjoy reeling in black crappie, chinook salmon, rainbow trout, walleye, and an assortment of bass. While this may seem an insignificant pastime for many, it is something that a number of environmentalists as late as 1980 did not think was possible on Lake Erie. For sure, many riders in the 1970s and early 1980s regarded Lake Erie as dead. Pollutants caused changes in the composition of life forms that lived in the lake's ecosystem, but it was not dead. In fact, the amount of biomass supported by the lake in the 1970s was the same as it was in the 1920s, roughly 50 million tons. On closer inspection, it was the economic value of Lake Erie that had died. Lake Erie's future is still not assured because some of the less obvious source inputs that caused its economic demise are still present and represent challenges in protecting the lake's complex ecosystem. <music> There are many challenges to rebirthing Lake Erie. The decline in the amount of contaminants entering the lake from the Detroit area via the Detroit River was caused by a reduction in heavy manufacturing in the region, specifically automobiles. It's doubtful that over the next few decades the lake will be forced to absorb pollutants at its pre-1980 levels. In the decades prior to the 1920s, Lake Erie supported a multi-million dollar per year commercial and sport fishing industry. The lake's commercially valuable species included cold water loving lake trout, blue pike, cisco, whitefish, walleye, and sauger. These fish not only need cold water, but they require high levels of dissolved oxygen. In the warmer months of late summer, these valuable fish species congregate in the cooler, oxygen-rich deep waters of the hypolimnion. That's the bottom layer of the lake. However, as air pressure gradients have stabilized since 1980, the mixing of water layers has declined. Normally, atmospheric instability produces wind, which in turn causes water molecules to move in response to atmospheric friction. In other words, it creates waves. These conditions are mostly present in the spring and fall months. These turnovers ensure that oxygen will be mixed throughout the vertical layers of the lake. Unfortunately, stable weather actually hurts the lake's ecosystem because dissolved oxygen levels impact the biological processes that affect the productivity of the lake. Lake Erie's ecosystem was further altered by eutrophication, which is a process of enriching a stream, pond, river, lake, or sea with nitrates and phosphates. Eutrophication encourages high growth rates among plant species, including weeds and short-lived algae. A primary culpability in Lake Erie's ecological crisis was waste material discharged into the lake. For decades, Cleveland, Detroit, Toledo, Erie, and other cities that sit on or near the shores of Lake Erie allowed untreated and partially treated waste to run off into the lake. About 80% of the water flowing into the lake washes the shores of Detroit and Windsor, Ontario before emptying into the lake as part of the Detroit River. During the peak years of pollution, there were nearly 11 million people contributing refuse to the collection of materials enriching Lake Erie. Besides urban sources of pollution, in the 1970s there were some 30,000 acres of agricultural lands bordering the shoreline. Annual rainfall and snowmelt washed tons of nutrient-rich manure, urine, and commercial fertilizers into Erie. There were also chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides that were streamed into the basin. In addition, nitric oxides expelled from millions of automobiles that operated in the lake's watershed interacted with water molecules and oxygen to create a form of dilute nitric acid. Nitric acid fell with rain and it also washed into the lake. Once in the lake, nitric acid formed nitrates, which further enriched the water and spurred on eutrophication. The last major cause of eutrophication was nature itself. 
Minerals and nutrients from rocks and soils in the watershed have always enriched the lake. Unfortunately, land development and farming speeded up the erosion and deposition of naturally occurring nutrients. The process of eutrophication that plagued Lake Erie produced large algae blooms. Particularly troublesome was and continues to be the filamentous algae cladophora. Being short-lived, dead and dying cladophora had, by the 1970s, accumulated in the hypolimnion to a thickness of 30 to 120 feet. The nutrient-rich ooze on the lake bottom lay dormant for decades. Its dormancy was facilitated by relatively high levels of dissolved oxygen in the hypolimnion, which encouraged the formation of a sealant on the ooze. Oxygen levels were sufficient to form ferric hydroxide. However, as a result of the reduction of the intensity of fall and spring turnover, the winds that caused the water to mix up, the level of oxygen in the hypolimnion declined. The insoluble ferric hydroxide was converted to soluble ferrous phosphate. Nutrients were then released to literally fertilize further, further algae growth. The decomposition of dead algae was facilitated by oxygen-demanding microbes that lowered the amount of dissolved oxygen. In late summer 1953, natural conditions set that economically calamitous scenario in motion. A protracted high-pressure center settled in over the lake and stayed in place for 28 days. In the shallow water basin, temperatures became rigidly stratified. With no winds to mix layers of water, oxygen levels in the hypolimnion dropped precipitously. As a result, the insoluble ferric hydroxide was converted into ferrous phosphate and the fuel required for enhancing eutrophication was unleashed. Mayflies, which are an important prey species for commercially valuable fish like whitefish and lake trout, were forced to leave or die from asphyxiation. Valuable fish either left or were otherwise killed by a lack of oxygen or by decreases in their food supply. This situation had a tremendous impact on fish harvest. Whereas in 1920 some 50 million pounds of fish were caught, in 1970 only a thousand pounds of fish were harvested. This represents a decrease of 99.99%. In response to concerns about pollution as well as declines in fish harvest, the United States and Canada entered an agreement in 1972 called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The GLWQA was renewed in 1978 and amended in 1987. During that decade, however, automobile manufacturing in the region declined. In summary, up to the mid-1990s, improvements in the lake were measured in the amount of dissolved oxygen in the central basin's hypolimnium. Sediments, too, from tributaries had been reduced by 50%. While there has been some reversal of those trends in recent years, the lake is once again the home of commercially valuable game fish such as black crappie, chinook salmon, rainbow trout, walleye, as well as white, small, and big mouth bass. Jet skis and swimmers are also abundant. There is, however, concern that improvements gained over the last three decades could be lost through declining public concern and enforcement of emission standards. Despite policies and emission regulations, Lake Erie's improved health is more the result of shifts in manufacturing from North America to Asia. Today, five of the top ten most polluted cities in the world are in China. It's as if factories simply closed up shop in the U.S. and reopened in other countries that have fewer operating costs. Mm. Well, I'll see you next time on the Vantage Point. Good night.